And now, Planning Committee member Thad Wilson will introduce the first of this year's three interactive panels entitled Evidence-Based Health Policy and Regulations. Thad? It is truly my pleasure to introduce this panel to you today. I'm going to recommend that you turn to pages 18 and 19 in your program to read the full bios. They're actually fascinating and go on for uh, uh, more depth than I'll be able to do here, but I want to get to our speakers. Um, so first speaker for today will be Gail Adcock. Uh, she is a nurse, a nurse practitioner, and a representative in the North Carolina House of Representatives. Our second speaker will be Bill Hoagland, Senior Vice President at the Influential Bipartisan Policy Center here in Washington, sure D.C. about that. Bill? <laughs> Our third speaker will be Dr. Robin Newhouse, and she's Dean at the Indiana University School of Nursing. Robin? Our moderator for this session is Dr. Bernadette Melnick, who, among other titles, is Dean of the College of Nursing at The Ohio State University, and I did add the the in there for you, Bern. There you go. And so I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Adcock. Gail, oh, come on up. Oh, no. I want to see. Well, right. I'm the same height standing as sitting, but, <laughs> and my husband always says, stand up. I go, I am standing up. But I'm going to stand up here because I like to get up close and personal being a nurse. And what I'd say is this. When I was asked the question, does evidence matter, I would say, yes, it does. But it is not sufficient. That in, the, in my four years in the North Carolina House of Representatives and in the seven previous years in local government, what I would tell you is context can never be underestimated. And we as nurses understand this, right? When you're going to do research, don't you first do a lit review and see what else has been done and what else is going on? right? When I go in, I'm in family practice. I'm a family nurse practitioner. When I walk in with my patient, I don't just assume the only thing on their mind was their chief complaint today, coming in to talk about their hypertension, their diabetes, their depression, or whatever, that there's context to that. When you teach students, and you got a great student, and that student did badly on an assignment, you don't assume that everything's going great with that student, right? You know that something's going on context. This is what politics is. This is the hardest thing I have to explain to nurses and, and to other constituents as well, is that politics is a completely non-linear process. If you walked into any general assembly, okay, I'm talking about state legislature, and it was simply a contest of who had the best data, you could be in and out in 20 minutes. Okay? It doesn't work like that. It's not about truth, justice, and the American way. It is about what do you do with your data? Who delivers the message? What language do you use? I'll use the example. So many of you are probably bilingual, if not trilingual or multilingual. If you walk in to a, or talk to a patient, a research subject, or a student, and they speak a different language than you, aren't you going to try to speak the language they speak either yourself or through an interpreter. If I'm talking to a patient who has a third grade education, I use different language than I talk to someone who has a PhD. But often we go in to talk to a legislator and we are talking to them using our language. What's important to us, what's important to our passion, and we're not considering the language they use and how they're going to hear it. We're not considering do we, have we even had a relationship with this person first? Or are we walking in sight unseen and we're expecting them to believe us because of the title before our name or the letters after our name? That does not work in politics because they all have REP in front of their name or SEN in front of their name and they often don't care about the letters after our name. Okay? So what I'd say to you is this, and a, a previous speaker was perfect on this. He was so on point and also our lunch panel today. And it's about, really, it's just the same thing you think about with your classrooms, your research subjects, and your patients. Relationships first. So if you're trying to get a big policy uh, change made in, let's say, in your state, and you wait until it's critical time, like, you know, it's bill filing period, and there's a deadline for when your bill can be filed. And that's when you go to meet with your legislator, you've already missed the boat. Because you've got to start working on those relationships well before crunch time. You need to either, because they're your legislator, or maybe they are, represent um, someone else that you know you can take as a colleague, and you can go well before the time where you need them to file a bill, sign on to a bill, or vote for a bill. This can start 
well, really, this is the perfect time. People are getting ready to be either elected or re-elected, in my case, hopefully elected for a third term. And so the best time to get me is right after the election. Gail, we're so excited you won. What's on your agenda for next session? How can I help you? And let me tell you something that keeps me awake at night. Let me tell you what I think is really important to your community back home and how you could help with this and who else can help us. So think about the language you use, the message you're giving, who's hearing the message, who's giving the message, because the 12th thing on the 12 deadly sins or whatever it was is not really the 12th one, it's the first one, and that's politics. Because it shouldn't be this way, but I'm just telling you that's what it is, okay? Is that who is going to gain and lose, who's going to look good and who's going to look bad, is often how your data, how your evidence is heard, interpreted, and used. And so if you're, um, if the person you need, like the chair of the health committee in North Carolina right now, the four chairs are all Republicans. I'm a Democrat. I don't care what party you are, okay? I'm the most nonpartisan person you'll ever meet. When I'm asked if I cross the aisle, I say, no, I live in the aisle. The aisle is where the action is, okay? And so I know that if I want to get my, well, every bill I've signed on to, but one has been a bipartisan bill because, number one, that's what I believe, and number two, that's the reality of the situation as well. And so if I want to get something on the health committee agenda, I go to my best contact, who's one of the chairs of health, and I have a cup of coffee with him, and I say, Josh, what do you think about this bill? What do you think about this issue? What do you think is the best way to get this on the agenda and get it heard? What are our chances, and what else can we do? And I take his advice. And often, I'm feeding him information and him evidence that he can use because if I stood up on the floor or I stood up in health and I gave that same information because I'm in the super minority party right now, then it will be heard a different way than if he says it. So think about who is giving your message. So I would say to you, just like our last speaker said, it's not just you need evidence and you need a story. And sometimes the evidence is more important and sometimes the story is more important, but they work together. I'll give you a quick example. In 2015, I was a freshman. I was a member of the freshman class in the North Carolina House of Representatives. There were 15 freshmen. I was the only woman, I was the only nurse, and I was one of only four Democrats. I was in the super minority. And every, I took out a two-term incumbent that people liked, but he wasn't doing a good job for our district. Not a bad person, just not, doing, not a good representative for our district. So the other side was looking at me like, let's see what this chick's got, okay? We're gonna find out what she's really like. And so when they found out that I was not gonna stand up and cast dispersions on their side, that I was more about getting the work done than who got the credit, they came to me and said, would you sign on to some bills with us? And one of the bills I, after reading it signed on to was a bill named after a baby that died from severe combined immunodeficiency, SCID. And this bill would require the state to add to the list of uh, diseases that newborns are screened for at birth so that they would, we would know right away that they had this so they could have a bone marrow transplant at the appropriate time and they could live past the first year of life because often, those of you who do this kind of work know, these children, if they're not diagnosed at birth, often don't live to be one. They usually become quite sick by the time they're diagnosed. And even with the bone marrow transplant, they died. And so what we had going for us with that bill was not only uh, three bill sponsors, two Republicans and a Democrat, but a bipartisan bill where we had about uh, equal numbers of uh, co-sponsors on both sides. And we had the mother, the brave mother of this child, Carly Nugent, the bill was named after her, who came to every committee meeting, both on the House and the Senate side, who spoke on the floor of the House with the permission of the Speaker of the House, and who said, I want to tell you about my child and why, even though she died from this, why I think the state should do this. She was a very powerful spokesperson. But we also had the data, because half the births in our state are Medicaid births. So we had the data for Medicaid, is how much Medicaid was paying for these bone marrow transplants for children, how many were surviving, and yet how much money could be saved, even with the cost to the, to the state for Medicaid of the screening, in the long run. So you had both the heartstrings approach and the reality of the situation, but you also had the data. And combined, even though that bill had been attempted to get through the House two other times, this time, it passed, that bill was filed in the middle of April 2015. It was heard in the House, it passed unanimously. It went to the Senate, it was heard in Senate Health. I got to be the person to present it in health, even though I was a, 
you know, on the minority team and not supposed to do this because I was the acknowledged expert in the room and they knew I could answer the questions that they couldn't answer and so they put me up front and it was sink or swim and I decided to swim. And that bill passed the Senate unanimously. And, and that bill went to the Republican governor who signed it and had a public bill signing. That doesn't happen with every bill. But this was a big deal. It was also a feel-good moment. So as one of the primary bill sponsors, I was invited to come to the bill uh, signing at the governor's mansion. The press is there. The table's there. The governor turns around at some point right before it starts. He goes, are you the freshman? I said, yes, sir, I'm the freshman. And he signs the bill. When a governor signs a bill, they sign it with multiple pens. So he signs it. He signs the first page with a pen, and then he hands the pen to the mother. And the mother walks across the room, and she hands the pen to me. And she throws her arms around me. I have a great picture of this, and every time I tell this story, I say I'm not going to do this. But I do. I get emotional. And it was that moment that I realized that it was her story that really made this work, but without our data, I'm not so sure it would have, would have worked. And, you know, I cried, she cried, the governor cried, of course this governor, he cried a lot. <laughs> he had a lot to cry about. But I'm just telling you, so consider the message you've got, the language you use, when you deliver it, who delivers it, and don't give up on evidence, but get your stories together, thank you. Thank you. It's kind of hard to follow. <laughs> uh, thank you uh, for the invitation to speak to you this afternoon and uh, for this conference. And thank you for what you do for nursing and uh, nursing education. I am the outlier here I, uh, on this panel. I have no specific uh, health educator or provider background. Uh, I only have spent quite a bit of time in this town working on policy broadly. In fact, I'm a little challenged here because uh, I'm an undergraduate degree from Purdue University, and we have Indiana University and Ohio State over here uh, oh going forward. Uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center, I know, the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, just real briefly, it was founded to about 11 years ago in this town by four former majority leaders of the United States Senate. Senator Bob Dole, the late great Senator Howard Baker from Tennessee, uh, Senator George Mitchell, and Senator Tom Daschle. And as its name would imply, uh, the goal of the center is to uh, bring together decision makers from both sides of the aisle to find some common ground on some of those major issues that the country faces and that need to be resolved in a bipartisan manner to have any kind of semblance of long-term stability going forward. I'm not going to kid you, bipartisanship in this town right now is uh, kind of difficult and short on supply these days, so finding consensus on uh, a number of these uh, issues is not, we're not always successful. But I'm going to come back to this uh, shortly. For there is one area where I, uh, where I see signs of bipartisanship, and that's the topic of this uh, panel, and that is the uh, evidence-based policy development. Now, as the outsider here, uh, and with some trepidation, uh, let me begin, however, by observing that while the estimates clearly vary uh, amongst the experts, many believe that less than half, less than half the medical care delivered in the United States is based on adequate evidence of effectiveness. If, uh, if this is even partially accurate, it would suggest that there is significant overutilization of medical services that are not necessarily improving the quality of care received by those, and it's also adding to the overall cost of care, which is a major issue. One of the most blatant examples of this is, the, is in the pain management area, was, and that was that infamous uh, letter written by Drs. Porter and Jick uh, uh, to the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine in the late 1980s that said, and I quote, less than 1% of patients treated with opioids developed addictions to them. 1%. We know how that letter became the basis for expansive growth in opioid prescription treatment and unfortunately the consequences that we're living with today. Another example, maybe some of you saw this in Health Affairs about a month ago, entitled, How Do Physicians, Policymakers Respond When a Procedure Proves No Better Than a Placebo? 
The article written by Alan Gerber from Yale and Eric Pasternak from uh, Brown, and they're the authors of this uh, recent book, Unhealthy Politics, focused on a 2017 Lancet study, the first blinded placebo-controlled trial of an invasive pr procedure used at, using a stent to treat stable angina uh, chest pain. And the cost of that procedure it ranges anywhere from $11,000 to $40,000, uh, with more than half a million of those procedures done annually. And the study found that the patients medically treated with the percutaneous per 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 coronary intervention, I'm not a doctor, stent, uh, were no better off than those that had the placebo procedure, if you can believe it. Similarly, in 2002, England, New England Journal of Medicine reported that a common operation performed on millions of Americans suffering from osteoarthritis of the knees uh, worked no better than a sham procedure where patients were sedated with a small incision while the surgeon merely pretended to operate. But what is equally and I think important about these two studies is what followed and the hostile reaction particularly by many inter interventionalist cardiologists and orthopedic surgeons who saw the studies as an attack on their specialty. Now, I have to believe that the procedures continue today, maybe at a reduced rate. But the truth is nobody can tell you how many stents or how many osteoarthritic knees surgeries are continued today unless an insurance company is willing to share the data with you. Now, I raise these latter two studies to simply highlight what I think are the significant challenges facing the use of rigorous evidence-based health research, often from the medical profession itself, but also from the public who understandably see the knowledge about various treatment effects as esoteria and asymmetrically distributed between the doctor and themselves, the, provide, the patient. Now, to its credit, the Obama administration, along with prominent Republicans, it is the bipartisan, I should have laid it on the table, I worked for Republicans on the Hill for many years, but prominent Republicans such as the late uh, Senator John McCain and Republican health policy expert uh, Gail Walensky, who works with us at uh, Bipartisan Policy, recognized the benefits to patients, payers, and providers of moving toward a more evidence-based medical system and help to create when the Affordable Care Act passed the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI. And PCORI's mission is to fund and disseminate research on comparative effectiveness of different interventions, such as drugs, diagnostic tests, or surgical procedures. Unfortunately, a contentious debate that surrounded PCORI and its critics charged that, uh, that uh, procedures operating a, uh, by that uh, particular organization would lead to rationing and death panels, and such that the final legislation, the final legislation established a very narrow uh, medical research program that left existing therapeutic and financing of healthcare essentially untouched. Literally, the findings of PCORI research may not, and this is in the law, may not put in place practice guidelines, coverage recommendations, and payment or policy recommendations. They can disseminate the research results through their usual channels of published medical journals and with the support of organizations such as yourself, but changing practice patterns to reflect the research remains a long-term challenge. As an old uh, budgeteer, the fact that uh, Corey is not required to consider whether an intervention is cost-effective I think weakens its political appeal and will make it its reauthorization next year, unwrapped from the passage at that time of the Affordable Care Act, a major challenge next year when it comes up for reauthorization. Why? Because the challenges to PCORI represent that what they represent to politicians and the political process. The authors of that book, Unhealthy Politics, argue that policymakers are not keen to accept responsibility for oversight and shortfalls in the medical profession, largely because, thank you very much, you, doctors, nurses, providers, enjoy much greater public trust than the government officials themselves. <laughs> uh, so I am concerned that without the strong support of organizations such as yourself, that what PCORI is doing 
to bring some semblance of evidence-based research to the practice of medicine. If they don't bring that up and don't push it forward, we will have not made as much progress as we should. Now let me make a very subtle but I think important distinction between evidence in the practice of medicine and evidence in the development of policy. Uh, and I'll end with a more upbeat uh, note. Uh, I think the two, while related, are also distinct from one another, practice versus policy. The two examples I have given on stents and knee surgery relate to the practice of medicine. In many ways, those questionable medical treatments were or are a throwback to real world observation experience, and I don't deny that isn't important, but not necessarily real world evidence. And while not unrelated to the practice of medicine, using evidence to develop health policy involves macro aggregated population based data sets as compared to the more micro individualized personalized precision focused medical practice that comes from randomized clinical trials. And it is here where there are increasing signs that in Congress that the evidence in the decision making process is finding some success. Strange fellows, I know this is, sounds strange to you, but a bipartisan duel of Speaker Paul Ryan and Democratic Senator Patty Murray of Washington championed legislation in early 2016 entitled Evidence-Based Policy Making Commission Act. It created an executive branch uh, commission which finalized its work about a year ago and issued a set of recommendations carrying out the law's goals of number one, to determine the optimal arrangements for which administrative data, survey data, and related statistical survey data that could be made available to facilitate program evaluation, policy relevant research, and cost benefit analysis by qualified researchers and institutions such as yours. All of this while trying and working to protect personal, personally identifiable information. The two congressional champions of that commission, uh, Murray and Ryan, uh, then introduced legislation entitled the Foundation of Evidence-Based Policymaking to begin implementing the recommendations of that uh, uh, Blue Ribbon Commission. The legislation, among other things, strengthens privacy protections and helps researchers access, access the data they need, but most importantly begins to change government culture to more readily engage in evidence-based policy. The legislation passed the House unanimously late last year, and we are hoping it will be adopted by the Senate in the lame duck session coming up uh, after the elections. Your organization's support for that speak for the speaker and the senator's work would be very welcome. And let me close with a specific example of where such evidence-based health policy has been effective. In the 1970s, David Olds developed a program in upstate New York known as the Nurse Family Partnership Program. Many of you probably were involved. The Nurse Family uh, par Partnership Program was tested in randomized controlled trials in New York, Tennessee, and Colorado. Based on those initial trials, the George W. Bush administration launched a pilot project to send nurses to provide assistance and advice for new parents at home. The pilot was an overwhelming success. Aggregate administrative data collected from the pilot showed better health, fewer hospital visits, and lower domestic violence. What followed was the Obama administration then and Congress creating the Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program, MECV, as part of the controversial Affordable Care Act. Nonetheless, the program is widely favored by both Republicans and Democrats, and earlier this year, MECV was reauthorized for five years in the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018, and HRSA just recently announced the awards of nearly $400 million in funding for 56 states, territories, and nonprofit organizations to support evidence-based home visiting services. Again, thank you. Thank you again, uh, the American Academy of Nursing, for what you do, what you do to promote programs like MECV, and for your support of evidence in both the practice of medicine and in the development of solid health care policy. Thank you.
I'm taking the perspective of someone that is generating evidence to inform policy. So I'd like to start by just covering a few statistics, which you probably already know. We all know about the exponential increase in deaths related to opioid overdose. We already know that 11.4 million misuse opioids. We already know that 1.6 million person years of life is lost in 2016 alone, most of the burden falling upon people aged 24 to 35. I could go on and on. This is what Dr. McGinnis called the plot of people in crisis. This is a public health emergency, and policy has a role. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about uh, this initiative that we have um, in, in embraced in partnership with Governor Holcomb of Indiana and Indiana University to address the addictions crisis. Governor Holcomb made opioid um, addiction and um, other deaths related to addiction, one of his major priorities because some of these statistics when he first entered his uh, role as governor and went on some listening tours. It was very clear that Indiana University had some complementary skills that we could lend to his major priorities for his um, state plan. We focused on a coordinated, comprehensive, integrated strategy that would partner and focus with our greatest strengths in areas of addiction. So our question was, how do we create evidence today that we can use tomorrow, immediately? And how do we create evidence that the policymakers can use to answer the questions that they have? Because when this crisis hit, there wasn't always the evidence that we needed to help them in their deliberation of which policy options they should consider. Our efforts in partnership with the governor are three goals. Number one, to decrease the incidents, the number of people with substance use disorders. The second is to decrease the number of people that die as a result of opioid deaths. The third is to decrease the number of babies born that have been exposed to substances in utero. So there are many things we could do, but as a university, we bring specific areas of expertise. Data, data science, data analytics. We have an Indiana Data Commons with health information exchange data, medical record data that can help provide data to answer these questions. Education, training, and certification. We know that we don't have the workforce that we need. We are a organization that can train addition, additional addictions counselors and add education uh, to interprofessional colleagues in the health sciences. The third area is, is policy analysis, economics, and law. Very early, we were approached by local, state, and federal elected officials to try to answer some of these questions. Basic applied and translational research, we naturally have expertise in, that can answer questions that the state was working on or add additional team members to help answer those questions. And the last one was community and workforce development. We knew that this was a complex and needed to be an integrated strategy. We approached it with a socio-ecological model, knowing that we couldn't just focus on the people with addictions, the individuals, but the individuals were nested with an in interprofessional social context. So we needed to partner with many, many people. That there were organizations within these contexts that also needed to be um, activated to help in this fight. And those organizations are nested within counties and towns with local elected officials. And then at the top of the socio-ecological model in our response is the social and public policy. We knew we had to affect policy that could be helpful to people and families that are dealing with addictions. So our focus, no, we, we knew right away that medical treatment was not the only thing that was going to help. We knew that there were policies and laws that could be helpful or could be harmful and make it more difficult for people to get into treatment. So in those first questions that were raised, we quickly charged a team. Uh, 16 projects were launched. We called them shovel-ready projects. And each one of those five areas of our capacity in uh, partnership with the state and many, many other um, people 
But we charged the uh, McKinney School of Law to help with the evidence synthesis of the policy options that our um, policymakers could consider. And that team spent a great deal of time both with our state uh, elected officials as well as our federal elected officials. As you might expect, there were things uh, that uh, could be uh, potentially important policy options related to harm reduction strategies, health care interventions, care coordination, and wraparound services, drug take-back programs, and many uh, more. That team followed up with a, a consensus survey to try to understand the appetite for different policy options and are now working on uh, a synthesis of the guidelines. As you know, there's a proliferation of guidelines um, to, to help uh, advise us uh, within healthcare on the opioid prescribing and, and many other things and help us understand where the commonalities are. So we know that harm reduction measures like naloxone are uh, incredibly important. Naloxone has, in our state, uh, been one of the major priorities of the grand challenge. Um, our work, we uh, recently have um, hold, held a, a naloxone distribution event and training event that was uh, very well attended, and we also sponsored those events in libraries with the idea this is a harm reduction strategy that if we can save someone that is overdosing, we gives a, it gives us another opportunity to help get them into treatment. But there are many, many other policy options that we have an appetite for or we don't have an appetite for. So I would say for us um, as nurses, it's incredibly important, three things, evidence, partnership, and presence, number one. Evidence, we have to present information that they need when they need it. We need to be ready with facts and we need to tell them how these policy options improve health and health care, the cost and the quality issues. They need to know how will this impact the, the people of the state or the nation. We need partnerships. We need to work with local, state, and federal elected officials. And we need to understand that their decisions have high stakes when they vote on a, uh, a uh, legislation that might be harmful or helpful. And it comes, um, really at the cost of health of people if they're uh, harmful. So also knowing that this interaction is a marathon, not a sprint. So we need to have, be good partners with our policymakers. And we have to have presence. When our policymaker calls and says, can you come consult or can you come testify, we need to make that an absolute priority because it's an important step for um, our engagement with the policymakers to help advise the health of the state and the nation. Please help me in thanking Gail, Bill, and Robin for outstanding food for thought. <laughs> I've long had a philosophy in God we trust, but everybody else better bring data to the table. Um, and I truly live by that philosophy. In working with so many healthcare systems all across the United States throughout my career, on evidence-based practice. A lot of this, whether it's policy or practice, is behavior change. And Gail, I thought what you talked about, the power of story, was so terrific, because most people don't change unless crisis happens or emotions are raised. How do you approach legislators, though? They get bombarded with tons of stories. How do you move yours to the top to create that sense of urgency? 
Oh, thank you for asking that question. So, I, so I'm in family practice, as I said, I'm a family nurse practitioner, so I think about this as I think about my patients. I think about a newly diagnosed di type 2 diabetic, and I would never consider walking into the room for a 20 minute, if I'm lucky, visit with a newly diagnosed diabetic and think that I can talk to them and teach them everything they need to know or talk about everything they need to know about the pathophysiology of diabetes, what they should and shouldn't be eating, how much they should be exercising, how to check their blood glucose, the meds sh they should be taking, et cetera, et cetera, in the 20 minutes that we have. But yet I see nurses do this all the time with legislators. We walk in for a 20 minute visit with them and we think we have to do the big brain dump, drop everything we have on them, the full load, because that's the only time we're gonna see them, right? We would no more walk away from that patient that we just diagnosed with diabetes and say, see you in a year. But we do it all the time with legislators and policymakers. So the answer to your question from my point of view and what works the best with me and with my colleagues is to get it in small pieces just like you do your patients, just like you do your students, and I don't do research for a living like many of you do, but I'm guessing you don't try to do your whole research thing in one big nut either. And so you have to consider this to be like climbing a mountain that you do a little at a time, you get acclimated. You, you never assume, when I, when I go in with my patient for the second visit, I don't assume they remember everything I told them the first visit, right? I say, what do you remember about our last visit and what questions do you have from that? And so we have to be a little less, I don't mean aggressive in terms of our passion, but a little less aggressive in terms of our timeline. Because when you go to a legislator and you want to tell them your story and make it sticky, you know, a marketing term, you want to number one, not give it to them so fast because again, context, we've just been to caucus meetings, we've just had committee meetings, we've just maybe seen six or eight other groups and now here you come and we got three or four more. So often you can say, I'm here to talk about, let's say the opioid crisis, what questions do you have? And start with their question and have a, you know, a collection of stories in your head you wanna tell. Or another way to approach it is to say, I'm, I am assuming you have a lot of questions. There are so many different ways to approach this problem. I'm here to tell you one story today and I'd like to come back and see you in a couple of weeks and bring a colleague with me and I want to tell you another story about that. That, that would be some of my suggestions. Great, go ahead. Ben. Bernadette, can I just add to this, uh, absolutely. Uh, if you're visiting your senator, your congressman, don't dump the whole bale of hay on them at one step. step. But there's one thing I want to raise here, and that is I worked for a, a long time on, in the Senate with uh, Senator Pete Domenici from New Mexico. And uh, uh, one thing that I learned in my 25, 30 years on, in the, working as a staffer in the Senate is remember each one of them, man and woman senator, has their own personal issues. In this particular case, Senator Domenici had a daughter with schizophrenia. Because he worked with Senator Kennedy and Senator Wellstone, you now have the Mental Health Parity Act of 1981 or two, whatever it was. It is those personal situations, they too, have to live with health care in a very personal way. To the extent you can relate to their problems as well as your problems, I think you go a lot further in terms of your advocacy. That's an excellent advice. This morning, we had an edge runner meeting. Several edge runners from the academy have spent the last 20 and 30 years of their life writing grants, working through the character builders of rejection until they get funded. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of frustration about, I've got all this evidence on this program, but I can't scale it. I just can't get reimbursed for it. The healthcare system is cost driven right now, whether we like it or not. One of the things I think as a researcher is we've got to put more cost outcomes on the research that we're doing. So more what I call so what hard outcomes. 
because if practice is going to change, so often a CEO, for instance, wants to know, what's my return on investment? Would you agree with that or add to it? I agree with it. I would agree with it, but I would also say that I tried to make the point in my presentation that there's a lot of practice that has return, and that means, as is always the case, I'm an old budgeteer, if you're going to expand in an area where there is good research, that might mean that you have to admit that this other practice is not a return, and there's a trade-off here. And, uh, I think that's, that's difficult uh, to, to stop something when, and refocus those dollars towards something that's more effective. Well, you bring up an important point. Just as evidence-based practice is so important, de-implementing practices yes. without best evidence is equally important. Robin, you were going to say something. Well, just um, thinking about the evidence generated by our edge runners, I think uh, Mary Naylor is a good example of not only conducting a number of trials that supported the transitional care model, but she stayed on the policy circuit and she testified and she talked to people and she tested her model again in, in different ways. So it didn't happen right away that the transitional care model was covered, but it did happen over time. But it, it happened because it was policy engagement and it was wrapped into other transitional care uh, payment methods. You, you bet. Rob, and you highlighted a fabulous partnership between your university and your governor. Mm -hmm. And I know you're still in the early phase of implementation, but what lessons have you learned or what would you do differently, if anything? I, I actually don't think I do anything differently, but what I would say is in academia, we are not known to work fast. If you so, so this was different. Um, it was a different approach. So, and you know, I've worked in health systems for a long time, and we do work fast. When an autoclave breaks, you're going to get it fixed, and you're going to figure out why. You're going to figure out why failures occur. So, it was really rapid cycle um, reviews for the work that we're doing, uh, engagement. Um, it was quicker, and the scientific review, the proposals were quicker, uh, uh, and. They were funded quickly, and they were expected to get up and going and start recruiting. So um, we, we announced in uh, October last year, the first set of Project 16 launched in January. Then we went through, through a longer phase, and engaging with our community and engaging with our faculty and staff helped to, that helped our faculty and staff think about ways they might serve in response to addiction. So there were uh, scoping, there were reviews, there were discussion groups, there was an ideas lab. So it helped engage people that had methods and maybe could deploy the methods to the addictions crisis. And the ideas lab also put teams of people together that have never been together before and created some very innovative solutions. That went through the typical proposal process and um, they'll be announced soon. So within a year, we would have funded uh, 32 studies, and, uh, and include, including policy studies in all those five areas. So I, I can't say I would have done anything differently because it was highly engaged. It was highly engaged with our community. But uh, I, I, maybe the one area is very quickly after the announcement, we received emails and calls from people uh, battling addictions, people that had stories about uh, their children that they're battling now. Some wanted to um, be known, others wanted to remain quiet. We heard from students, we heard from parents, we heard from policymakers, uh, just a whole group of social organizations, for-profits, non-profits. It was it was community engagement as I have never seen it. I imagine doing a research study. I've never done a research study and had somebody call me, you know, and say, you know, I, I want to help with this. But this was a situation where people resonated with the response. In fact, we've done a follow-up survey of um, 
Indiana residents, and they, the majority um, are well versed in the opioid crisis, and most believe, about 75%, um, believe that we're not doing enough quick enough. So I think that would be my lessons from the people. Great. Yep. I'm going to now read some questions from our audience. This one is very near and dear to my heart because I just did a study on this issue. There is evidence that longer shifts, 12-hour <laughs> shifts, are detrimental to patient safety and to the physical and mental well-being of nurses. Why are healthcare systems all throughout the country still allowing 12-hour shifts. Um, in the study that we just published, we actually showed, as many other studies have done, that longer shift work leads to poor mental and physical health in nurses. And longer shift work leads to more medical errors, which is compromising healthcare quality and patient safety. So I'm gonna address this question to you, Robin, because you also have worked a lot with healthcare systems. Why can't we change this outdated practice? So uh, the... <laughs> So there's some supporters, so we're starting a little consensus here. You know, and, and I'm, I, I'm not sure that it's popular with nurses, um, it right? That's part of the issue. Now, the studies that I saw said 12 hours. It's once you get past 12 hours. I'm not, I, you'll, you'll have to, is that about 12 hours too? So it's not that the 12-hour shift was the issue. The issue is staying over the 12-hour shift and the documentation that has to, and then the 16-hour shift, and that's when... I don't know the cut point of when it starts to deteriorate, but I think that's the lesson. If the evidence says 12-hour shift is safe, we've got to figure out policies to make sure that people are relieved on time. It's hard, you know, yeah. it is hard. But, uh, but nurses do tend to like the 12-hour shifts. In, Very so I, I'm so. hearing, I know that you, <laughs> you know that. And um, they do like working three days and having extra time. Um, so uh, I, it is a dilemma, but we, we do know that there are issues with safety and quality, and we have to figure out how to minimize our use yeah. of time beyond the 12-hour shift. Yeah. Could I ask, as the outsider here, is this a, also a function of the workforce, the availability of nurses out there? Um, a factor, a but, factor, but not the major factor. Our national study actually showed the errors went up the longer after eight hours were worked. Mm -hmm. Ten-hour shifts led to more errors, 12 hours even more. So I pulled all the chief nurses in Columbus together and I showed them a body of evidence. And I said, when are we going to stop this? And the answer that I received was, our nurses love these. They'll whine if we stop them. And my answer was, seriously, we've got to do the right thing for our patients and for our nurses. And we've got to let evidence drive the right thing to do. We really do. Um, so there is a lot of opportunity in front of us. There's no doubt about that. I want to ask another question from somebody in the audience. What are some strategies for identifying those health policy issues that could have bipartisan support? Sorry, you're looking at me, I'm guessing. Okay. 
Um, so let's, I'm going to again talk state level, which is what I know the most. Uh, well, one is to talk with your lobbyist, if you have an organization, whether you're a health system, uh, an educational system, an association, you probably have a lobbyist, so you have a presence in the halls. And I'd sit down with them and say, tell me what you're hearing and what you're seeing, because that their job is to walk those halls and talk to everyone and to make friends with everyone and have relationships with as many members as they can on both sides of the aisle. And so often they see the issues that would have that are nonpartisan in nature and have bipartisan support. And so they can give you some guidance. Um, the other is to look at the kinds of bills that are passing. You know, because you can clearly see what's got bipartisan support. Uh, now, in our case, right now in North Carolina, you can get a bill through both chambers with no bipartisan support because of the way the numbers are lined up. But if you look at the bills that have both um, Democratic and Republican sponsors and co-sponsors and have a mix of votes, so it may not be unanimous and only takes 61 votes for anything to pass our chamber and 26 and the other, but if you see that there's a mix of both parties in there, you're going, okay, I'm on to something. So people care about, let's say, whether it, let's take health care. So they care about um, the opioid crisis. For instance, we had a STOP Act passed in 2016. Um, 17, and then we had the HOPE bill passed, all these acronyms, in 2018. And they were unanimous on both sides, because this is now the mom and flag and apple pie issue. I mean, everybody cares about it. Um, so those are two ways I can think of. And the other is to ask the members of the health committee. So you, you know, you all legislatures have web pages. You can pull up the web page. You can pull up the standing committees for the House and Senate. You can see who serves, who's in leadership, who are their rank and file members. You can see who you know or who you could know because they're in your district you could get to know. And you, and you ask them for a cup of coffee and you say, I'm interested in advancing the health status of the people in your district and the people of the entire state. But I know that you're down there every day and I'm not, and you know how things work. What do you see? that's possible to do and that you think could be done maybe in this session or more than one session. And often you get some great advice that way. Great advice. So to wrap up this session, if you had one piece of last words of wisdom, how we can speed the translation of the evidence into policy, what would it be? And Robin, I'll start with you. I, I would say uh, tailoring the evidence to the policymakers' needs to make sure we're focusing on the decision that's on their desk that they need to make. Bill. Boy, that's a hard one because um, let me approach it gingerly. There is a there is a sense today that. Uh, Evidence is not that important in policy making. That the truth doesn't matter. I'm trying to be this, I'm being ginger, but. Uh, You're in a friendly crowd. You're okay. Somehow we have, to, we have to strengthen the understanding of some at the highest levels that facts are facts and they cannot be changed. Yeah. And so I would say, don't be in an echo chamber where you're the only one using your evidence and telling your data. We need other people to use your evidence and use your data and to be supporters of you and to be collaborators with you. So when you can get the Chamber of Commerce to use your data, when you can get educators to use your data, when you can get people who support uh, business and environmental protection and economic growth, when you can get them to use your data, then people will listen to it because they start hearing the same story over and over from different people and they say, hmm, there's something here. Great. I want to thank our terrific panelists. You all did a brilliant job. Thank you. And lastly, I want to call all of us to urgent action. There is still so much evidence out there that's taking 10, 20, 30 years, if you're lucky, to get it into policy and practice. 
In the last question I will ask all of us here today is what can we do in the next five to 10 years if we know we cannot fail? And let us keep dreaming, discovering, and delivering a brighter future for the people of America. Thank you. Great job.